audience. Uh, if you are um, hearing us, if you're with us for the first time, this is a very robust discussion around a need in the state of Maryland, regionally and nationally. So I look forward to a robust discussion and we'll move through the formalities as quickly as possible on my end. Uh, my name is Mara Tolzo Laughlin and I'm the Executive Director of the Maryland Environmental Health Network. Uh, the network is one of two co-chairs of the uh, Maryland Environmental Justice Legislative Team, along with Clean Water Action. Uh, the EJLT is what we call it. Uh, we work together to magnify community voices through legislative process to address environmental inequities in Maryland. We are born about trying to pass uh, legislation without the requisite coalitions and the idea that um, that there are many folks who are interested in doing this work but need an entree. So the team came together to work on that, develop a learning table that is open-ended. And so we welcome the participation of anyone who's interested in creating a more inclusive and equitable environmental policy landscape. Uh, the founding members include Blue Water Baltimore, the beloved Community Church in Akakeek, Maryland, uh, Chesapeake Physicians for Social Responsibility, uh, Chispa, Maryland, Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake, the Maryland Sierra Club and the League of Conservation of, uh, Voters, among others. And as I said, we're always looking for more members to make our work robust. Um, the network's principles and how we ended up uh, facilitating this group and being a part of the conversation is because our mission is to promote the elimination of environmental threats to human health, which ultimately means we want to level the playing field for vulnerable populations so that your race, ethnicity, gender, or other status is not a determinant of your health. What we're gonna to cover today, as I mentioned, is a fairly broad scope of work. Uh, we're going to talk about what public health has to do with the idea of community science. Uh, Dr. Wilson and Dory will help us to cover the landscape of community science, as well as emerging ideas, proposals, and bills for the upcoming legislative session. And we'll uh, create space as usual for questions and answers, and for um, you to discuss uh, this principle and why we think it's necessary at this time in the state of Maryland. And then we'll close out with announcements and uh, details on the next uh, team meeting. Uh, our first uh, featured partner is Dory Cantor Pastor. She's a community advocate, a consultant, and a real expert on a broad range of environmental and community issues at the local, state, and national level. Uh, she's worked at the EPA for 36 years before she left in the early days of 45's administration. Uh, she managed programs and developed expertise in lead poison, toxic air pollution, environmental enforcement, and so many other programs. She's the former legislative chair, conservation chair, and executive committee member of the Maryland Sierra Club. And she currently serves on the Energy and Air Quality Committee of, the Mo of Montgomery County and on the steering committee of Save EPA. If you're not on their Facebook group, you should be. Uh, it's a group of EPA alumni who dedicate their lives they're continuing parts of their careers and capacity to educate and advocate about 45's assault on EPA and public health. We couldn't use uh, a better grouping of advocates at this time when we are watching the, uh, the civil society fail to deliver these kinds of outcomes. She has a degree in civil and environmental engineering from Cornell University and will share just a bit of what she knows about this work and why it's necessary with us as we move through the conversation. Our other partner for today is uh, none other than Dr. Sokobi Wilson. He's an environmental justice advocate, a researcher, and an educator. There isn't a person uh, emerging in this work who hasn't somehow worked with him, uh, who he is not connected to, and who uh, the Maryland Institute for Applied Environmental Health uh, is not touched on, whether through a formal education or just impact on the work that comes out of there. Uh, he's an environmental health scientist with well over 10 years of experience working in community university partnerships on environmental health and justice issues. He is an um, unparalleled expert and exposure scientist and applied environmental health, including community-based exposure assessment, environmental justice science, epidemiology, health disparities, which as we all know, are very different than just inequities. Uh, he works in a built environment, pollution monitoring, community-based participatory research, which means he works with people. Um, and among other things that he is working on, there are many more things. It would take up the entire afternoon if I were to try to touch on them. But he is a vocal and responsible advocate pushing for an equity-based approach, which means he's often asking, uh, telling, uh, referring people when they ask him to do a thing to find a community person to talk to about it. And that is an incredible um, use and utility in a time when uh, everyone is scrambling for experts, when, when we're all aware of what the problems are. 
So just to move us um, into uh, the next section, I'll talk very briefly about why environmental health in general is focused. Uh, if you've ever been on one of these webinars before or really in any room where people use the word environmental health, you've probably seen one or two of these slides. Uh, it really talks about how uh, environmental health is all encompassing and focuses on air pollution and water and inadequate sanitation, chemicals, radiation, noise, occupational risk, the built environment and climate change. So why wouldn't we be involved in these kinds of discussions is probably a narrower place to start. Um, for, our ben for the benefit of folks who are joining us for the first time, environmental health integrates trends at the population level to connect us with what occurs within us because it's certainly uh, related to what's going on around us. We examine the reasons why health is easier or harder to reach for specific groups and gaps in ability to thrive in society and culture. Our goal is very simple, to lower the likelihood of untimely death and sickness and help human beings to achieve the ability to have positive and meaningful lives of their own making. There's some pretty broad uh, justice implications of that kind of work. So um, when we talk about who a citizen scientist might be, we're talking about anyone who voluntarily contributes their time, their effort, or their resources in collaboration with scientists or alone. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about why we think it's necessary but for the networks part, uh, we use the word community science where others are in our group might use the word citizen science. And that's a specific term of art because we're concerned about popul population level for sure. But what we're focused on is building hyper-local hyper support, which means not alienating community members on the basis of being a resident. Um, as, as our guests can tell you, uh, the caravans of people moving through the world trying to make sure that they are seen are not the only ones who have a right to clean air and clean water. We really have to be very thoughtful when we craft these decisions around policy. And for our part, the network is pushing for the use of community science so that we are inclusive rather than exclusive. Um, that's ultimately because what we promote or devalue impacts the health of generations of Marylanders. We'll talk more about how that works but it fits into our uh, core principles of inclusion of directly impacted communities in planning, siting, and operations, but also means that as we look to a concept like uh, community science, it's because while we have great case studies and really great narratives of people who have been harmed, we also have to speak to the local health impacts, the usage of data, so that we can increase the agency and resiliency for communities while communicating in a language that policymakers understand. Uh, we're worried about a few things. Here are just some of the threats that we are concerned about when we are talking about impacts to community. Noise, light, air, water, pollution, all of these things. And particularly in Maryland, the rise of fossil fuel infrastructure and natural gas infrastructure in particular. We're also worried about risk privatization, lack of voice and agency for communities in the footprint of all of the above, and land use decisions that impact the air quality and water and, and really ultimately lead to the degradation, degradation of both. Uh, with that, uh, I will talk really briefly because the, our guests are going to speak in more detail about threats to our water supply. This image came from Excellence for Great Lakes and Human Health at NOAA. And it's just an example of all the ways that our water quality is threatened. If you joined us in the previous uh, um, legislative briefing, we heard from folks who are working on legislative policy, specifically on the water side. And we heard about nutrient overload, chemical spills, pesticide use, just the increased use of pharmaceuticals, and all the ways that the water supply is going to be endangered. For air quality, we're worried about everything on this screen, and Dr. Wilson will weigh in um, a little bit more deeply with how his work touches on all of these things, but we're worried about commercial material production, mixed use zoning, and all the other synergies that come together with fossil fuel transit, carbon intense mining operations, and mega sized agricultural operations all over the state of Maryland. We're worried about health, equity, and justice, and the things we've heard about from the folks we work with are that uh, some in the scientific community have previously been concerned about the integrity of this data. So I would love to hear from our um, guests on where they stand on the justice implications versus the need to have data that can be relied on. And we'll be looking to their example to figure out how to balance those concerns. Um, in terms of solutions, we're looking for a responsible use of natural resources and infrastructure that mitigate climate change impact to protect vulnerable populations, and we're delivering the, top, the end of top-down decision-making that exaggerates existing inequalities. We are looking in this conversation specifically 
to talk a lot about how we're um, looking at education and other anchor institutions to support the use of local data so that we can make the case that harm is occurring or that it could occur. Dr. Wilson? I, um, we're going to open up with some things for you to introduce yourself to folks and talk a little bit about environmental injustice issues as you see them in Maryland. Okay, can y'all hear me all right? Perfectly. Yeah, I, I just texted my pan uh, fellow panelists. I'm out of town right now. My internet connection is not the best right now. So hopefully I'm going to try to go through these slides pretty quickly. How much time do I have? Uh, you, ha you have you have a probably 10 or 15 minutes to and we and we broke up the slides so we'll just we'll just hang we'll we'll uh, stay in close communication okay cool so when we think about community uh, uh, thanks again for having me I'm Dr. Jacoby Wilson I'm at the University of Maryland College Park I'm an environmental health scientist and I've been doing um, community engaged work for really 20 years since um, undergrad uh, over 20 years but really my work started in grad school at, at UNC Chapel Hill so what I want to do is just kind of talk about the different types of community engaged research um, and, and, you know, the, the different terms that are out there, but really get into some of the work really around air quality. So we think about community engagement, there's a community engagement continuum. So you start on the left side from outreach and you move to the right side of continuum to community driven. And really the gold standard of, of doing this kind of work is community driven research. So whether it be community owned and managed research, uh, community yeah. science. So the idea is you want to have more community involvement. As you move from left to right, there's more community involvement. There's more uh, impact. There's more trust. There's more communication. Usually outreach and consultation are very unidirectional, right? I'm giving you information. You're not really being engaged. You're not really providing feedback. When you get the involvement, we're more about having like a community advisory board. So you may have a, a, a select stakeholders or informed stakeholders for community who are really trying to push the research and make sure it's grounded in the community. But uh, the two that I do the most of are what we call participatory research. So you have participatory action research or in, from a public health background uh, a standpoint, uh, we have community-based participatory research. And you also have community-driven research. So I mainly do those two. So those are more driven by the community. So it's other community for the community and by the community. Uh, next slide. Or do I, I move it forward? I got it. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. And so when you think about a community-based participatory research, it's collaborative. Uh, the community is involved in all stages of the research process. Uh, next slide, please. We jumped a, a few. Oh, they, you moved them around a little bit. Oh, say that again. Oh, so, so when, you, when we do community-based participatory research, uh, that means the study questions come from the community. The, stu the community is engaged in the study design. Uh, community members are helping with data collection analysis and also dissemination and translation to action. And so what's important about this kind of work is, is the community is a unit of identity, right? Contextual expertise, expertise and community knowledge are value, okay? And so in one of my, my projects, my long-term work has been with a group called the West End Revitalization Association in North Carolina, in Mebane, North Carolina. Their community they didn't have what we call basic amenities, sewer and water infrastructure. The roads weren't paved. They didn't have proper ingress and egress. They were on septic tanks and well water. Uh, and they were going to build a highway through this uh, post-slavery black neighborhoods, okay? And so what we did is uh, community is they develop a, a, a process called community-owned and managed research. So if you go back to that a continuum, when I say community driven, community owned and managed research is the gold standard, again. And so what we're able to do is to work with residents, train them to do their own septic system assess assessments, do household surveys, train them, collect water samples from tap water, uh, well water, and also river water. And we found high levels of some of the uh, maximum contaminant levels, uh, high levels of uh, E. coli, and also enterococcus and other indicators of, of fecal uh, contamination. And so this work was the foundation for the community's administrative complaint. So you had a research component, but they also had an administrative complaint in the EPA about the siting of the highway. And that they were the first community in the country to say that the lack of basic amenities was an environmental justice issue as part of a administrative complaint process. Next slide, please.
So as part of this work, they were able to block this highway that was being built. So this is a tangible outcome of their community-driven research. Next slide, please. And so in the case of working with that community, you know, that whole community owner man's research framework, that came out of the community. You know, as an academic, I, will, I provided technical assistance, but I did not drive the research. I did not lead the research. I provide a, a particular set of skill sets and act as a resource. But all of that work came out of the community. And because of that work, they were able to get their roads paid for the first time, and they were able to get the first time installation of sewer and water infrastructure. Next slide, please. Yeah, my internet connection is a little slow. Another one, so that partnership in Mebane, as I said, that's 20 years of work. So when you're thinking about environmental justice issues, it's not gonna happen overnight. You have to have dedicated, committed uh, effort to address the problems. So when, as a researcher, as an academic, I can't do helicopter science. I can't, you know, kind of, you know, Johnny come lately, fly by night science. It cannot be extractive. It has to be a long-term commitment to help and to address the problems. And that's, that speaks to the need of having these long-term partnerships. This next uh, community group that I work in is called uh, the Low Country Alliance for Model Communities. They're based in Charleston, South Carolina. I've been working with that community for about 12 years. And next slide, please. The issue in Charleston is the fact that the port of Charleston is expanding. And uh, this is what we call a good swimming issue. So anytime you have, you know, ports, whether it be, you know, the Port of Baltimore, Port of New Orleans, you know, any, any in the coastal areas, we have ports. So because the Panama Canal is opening up more, we have more goods coming to the country. That means you have more ships, you have more diesel trucks, you have more rail, and there's a lot of pollution associated uh, with those uses. And there's, of course, impacts on air quality and impacts on human health. Next slide, please. So this, this community is not only impacted by goods movement, they have four Superfund sites, they have metal recyclers, they have an incinerator, uh, they have leaking underground storage tanks. They have brownfields. They're also in the food deserts. They have high rates of poverty, high rates of crime, and they have issues around violence. So you think about environmental injustice, it's not just the fact they're overburdened by hazards. It's a high concentration of psychosocial stressors and the fact they don't have a lot of good infrastructure, you no know, green space, parks, uh, food infrastructure. And so what we did to build as part of the partnership uh, with Low Country Lines, Small Communities, our overarching partnership is called the Charleston Area of Push Prevention Partnership, CAPS. Uh, but the education program that we built is called Project Excellence. And the whole idea was to build a capacity uh, through science to impact change. Next slide, please. Yes, Dr. Wilson, I'll just say, it sounds a lot like the communities you've touched on so far have problems that are really parallel to the kind we have in, in the state of Maryland. With yes, that's correct. That, that it isn't just the issue that's presenting on the top, but a history of disinvestment and a lack of resources that amplify the problem. Is that right? Exactly. And that's why I wanted to kind of show y'all these two examples first, because point is, you see the same type of issues in other parts of the country, but to, to impact change, we need long-term investments, uh, resources, whether it be financial investments, I also learn long-term investment when it comes to research investments. Awesome. Okay. So we've done education workshops uh, in the community on some of the, the toxicants of importance uh, on air quality issues. Next slide, please. We've been, again, this is spring 20, we've been doing this work for a long time in the community. So we do a lot of workshops. Um, GIS mapping, training folks on how to do their own mapping. Again, long-term work in the community. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Wilson, it looks like you have a lot of support. So in the model that you develop where communities interact with um, edu and environmental advocates, researchers, they, these folks are lending their capacity to these efforts and you are coordinating them to work together under this umbrella with the support and guidance of the community? Yes, and so that's where the community-based particular research framework comes in. I mean, that's a partnership. So the whole idea is you want to make sure you have the right experts. So environmental health experts, uh, epidemiology experts, air quality monitor experts, GIS mapping experts, legal experts, one of the things about going back to uh, my community partner in Mebbin, the Western Revitalization Association, Omega Wilson, who's the president of, of where, who's been the president since his founding, since the mid-90s, Omega said, 
uh, when we go into uh, town hall meetings with the uh, city of Mebane, we we they would have lawyers. We didn't. We would feel naked. You gotta have lawyers when you're talking about environmental justice issues. You gotta have lawyers provide technical assistance. So you need the researchers. You need to have the advocates. And you need to have the lawyers working together as part of the research infrastructure, the, the infrastructure, the, the technical assistance infrastructure supporting community's efforts. Fantastic. One of the things that we did also, and uh, with uh, this is Mr. Fraser Raheem, one of the community leaders, we trained folks on how to uh, do air quality monitoring, but also to do soil sampling. Because you heard me say they had super fun sites, they have leaking underground storage tanks. And all, and, and so go to the next slide. So people can collect these soil samples and, and get this data. So what important things about uh, the the Lamsey Group, they ha have a mitigation plan agreement under NEPA. I think they were the first community in the country to get a mitigation plan agreement with the uh, under NEPA. They actually get money under NEPA through a mitigation plan. They have four million dollars to address current and future impacts of the planned port expansion. And so this data that we collected has been used to inform the implementation of the mitigation plan in Charleston. And that's another, and as you uh, pointed out, that's under the National Environmental Policy Act. Policy Act, Act. yes. It promotes environment and, and was um, enhancement of the environment and was established by executive order and the president's council? Yes. Okay, just wanna make sure everybody's on the same page. So, so, another, so another outcome so another outcome of this partnership has been the establishment of, of, of CRAB or C CRAB. So LAMPS is, is sort of like the translation and impact arm. CRAB is the research arm of the community. That's so true. research comes through and it makes the research again, it's of the community, for the community, and by the community. And we just submitted a grant proposal uh, in October to get funding to build out a hyper-local community-based air quality monitoring network using a combination of low-cost sensors, both indicator grade and uh, sort of more federal equivalency method grade sensors to collect real-time data that can be used to know where the hot spots to help impact risk aversion behavior. Hey, don't go walking here because it's too, pollution levels are too high. Don't go walking there. But also that data be used to inform risk mitigation activities. And I can so imagine, this is a this is a proposal we just made. And I can imagine that there are several forms of application in the state of Maryland that would form under those same parameters. We exactly. Together on air quality monitoring with our Maryland Department of Environment, and specifically around the idea that the monitoring has to happen at a couple of different levels. So this is an incredible uh, opportunity to have it happening in a few places at once to get a sense of scale. Exactly. Next slide, please. And so as part of our long-term collaboration and this, re this data that was collected, the community group was able to shut down the, the, the county incinerator. Yeah. Okay, so just again, I wanted to show some examples and other parts of my long-term work with communities where, where science can lead to real action. Science can be used to empower folks, build capacity and lead to action, but it has to be community driven. It has to be these questions these projects came from the community. I just didn't come and say, hey, we're gonna study this. No, these were priorities of the community. And I came in to develop a study design that be responsive to the community's priorities. Mm. Okay, next slide, please. Bladensburg, Maryland. So if we get to Bladensburg, Bladensburg again, so uh, as Tamara's mentioning, you know, I, I provided you these two uh, external examples but we're gonna be leveraging, I'm leveraging based a lot of the things that I've done with WERA and, and with LAMSI and bringing that to the work in Maryland uh, with folks in Bladensburg and other parts of the state, also with Brandy One with the B2B Coalition. But uh, next slide, please. So the issues in Bladensburg, like in a lot of our communities, they have these sources that are under-regulated. So in Bladensburg, we have the Ernest My uh, concrete block plan. So they make concrete block, so what happens is you, you have concrete dust that's produced, but you also have a lot of truck traffic that comes in and out to take the block to construction sites. They want to expand this concrete block plant to a concrete batching plant, which means that they have wet concrete that's mixing on site, and they have the trucks that take it to nearby construction facilities. Y'all have seen those, those trucks that have the spinning? They're spinning, yeah. and right? So they, yeah. they, they drop that, that wet concrete off so it can be used for, you know, like, real quickly at some uh, nearby construction site. 
So this, this facility has been operational since 1929. They never had any air quality monitoring. There's never been a site assessment. There's no idea what types of contaminants are on site. Under the, under the state statute, the general statute, they are not required to do air quality monitoring. Okay. In the state of Maryland. They are not required. In the state of Maryland. Wow. So there's a, le there's a legal gap that's created this, con this situation where this type of source hasn't been required to do monitoring. So the fact that they're expanding, they're trying to expand to include a concrete batching plant using a special exception means that our legal structure is creating conditions that, that, that create problems for local communities. Next so slide, please. This is a okay. gap to be sure. It's a gap. This is a gap. And then and so, and, and all for all intents and purposes, this type of industry can exploit that, gra that gap because if they've never been examined or looked at, their growth is not going to be examined or looked at. Yeah, if so if you have a gap, and then exactly as you said, and then they're using a special exception to the zoning ordinance, they can bend the rules and do a workaround. And then at the same time, under the state statute, they're not required to do air quality monitoring. So it puts the community in, in a de very defensive position and actually understanding what is on the site now and what will be the impacts of this expansion on air quality and human health. In the Prince George's County, we have a health impact assessment ordinance, which should apply to this type of facility expansion. But unfortunately in the county, any facility that's seeking expansions under a special exception, they are exempted from having to do a health impact assessment. Wow. So that creates wow. another gap. Folks who have been following us, we did a, um, a session a few weeks ago on health impact assessments and on some state action to get it put in at the Public Service Commission in advance of other places where it might be useful. So looking at this kind of gap would be really important for folks who are interested in that and seeing it, seeing some demonstrative um, use of the tool across the state. And this is just an example of the aggregate. So you see the aggregate, is, it can be, you know, produce particular matter. Mm -hmm. So you can have partic particular matter PM10, which is 10 microns, PM25, 25 microns. Also uh, think about silica dust. So uh, workers could be exposed to silica and have silicosis. But those of you who know why particular matter is so impo important for public health, it can cause asthma attacks, asthma, hospitalizations, emergency department visits. It can cause stroke, elevate the blood pressure, lead to birth defects, increase birth, uh, low weight birth weights. It also uh, cause cancer, premature mortality, okay? And also uh, reduce life expectancy. So, and also particular matter can deliver other, other toxicants uh, to different organs, your liver, your kidney, uh, and also the blood brain barrier to, the, to your brain. So that's why this issue is very important. And this is why this type of use is very important. Next slide, please. So you have an elementary school that's nearby, Blake's Railroad School that's near, within a mile of this facility. Next slide, please. Just wanna show you a couple of sites that they're nearby. Of course, the Anacostia River is nearby. Uh, and, and so people who may be uh, recreating, you know, no contact, and people who are walking, people may be kayaking or rowing, could be impacted by the dust from this facility. Next slide, please. And then what's interesting, you have this uh, church, this, this historic black church that's right by the concrete plant. It was built before the concrete plant was built. And so this speaks to the whole issue of, you know, environmental injustice. It's gotten so bad that they no longer can have funerals. They no longer can do church in a week. They only can do church on Sundays because of all the dust and truck traffic. And each Sunday, they have to use a shovel to remove the dust from the front door because of all the, the dust that's been created during that week. Next slide, please. And uh, just to ask Dr. Wilson, this doesn't trigger any Department of Health or uh, Department of Natural Resources or MDE, um, Maryland Department of Environment, policies, regulations, or uh, triggers to protect human health when you have that kind of demonstration. You, you, it should, if, if it doesn't do it there, you know, trigger, then when would it do it, right? Because they're 40 feet away. They're 40 feet away from the operation of the facility. And again, the, one of the biggest impacts are all the diesel trucks that come in and out, taking a concrete block in, and con you know, materials in and taking concrete block out. And so y'all know diesel exhaust is very important because acute exposure leads to burning the eyes, nose and throat. It can impact your coordination, your concentration, but also there's 40 contaminants in diesel exhaust that can cause cancer. 
So diesel exhaust has a lot of uh, public health effects, both acute effects and chronic exposure has, can lead to some adverse health outcomes as well as cancer. Next slide, please. So we, uh, in consultation with the Port Towns uh, CDC is one of the main groups fighting against the expansion of this facility. Uh, we, again, this is kind of a communion form and now it's, not, we, we want to do more community science with them with training residents to how to use the sensors. Mm -hmm. But the, the whole idea of what we are right now in our partnership is more or less having a student who uh, was able to select some monitoring sites near uh, this facility based on community priorities. So, so what we've done is we've used these sensors. Mm -hmm. They're low cost sensors that can get real time data on particular matter and also on VOCs. The sensors blue in blue is called the air beam. Uh, air beam one can only measure PM 2.5. Air beam two can measure PM 10, PM 2.5, and PM 1. It also can measure temperature. It can measure uh, pressure and humidity. And so when you think about these low cost sensors and why they're important in, in doing community, community science work, mm -hmm. what's important is, you know, some of these sensors are very good for giving you a signal, right? These sensors both cost about less than $250. Now, as you, if you wanna have higher quality data, there's different types of sensors that we'll talk about later in our conversation. But these sensors are good at giving you signals and could potentially be used in exposure disease association studies, okay? So we monitor at five locations uh, around the um, concrete facility. And we monitor three times a day uh, in the morning rush hour, uh, non-rush hour morning, and in the in the evening rush hour, because with the uh, you have a lot of commuter traffic in the area too. So you have commuter traffic and industrial traffic. So we wanted to see we wanted to see spatial and temporal patterns uh, of PM uh, uh, concentrations and also VOC concentrations. So the ATMO two, which is the second sensor, is used to measure total VOCs. And so these are really useful if you want to measure, uh, uh, look at pollutants around heavily trafficked areas. Go ahead, I'm sorry. And essentially, these are different kinds of tools that help you to get measurements in the absence of having a large scale state driven process, just so that you can start to capture what the trends are in a community at, at different times of day, so that you are not um, attacked as someone developing this capacity for getting skewed data at a time that is not universal. And so all of these are safeguards that you use to be able to pinpoint the when and the how, because the what is, a, is, an, is not an open question. Yeah, I mean, what's important to follow on your point, we have some regulatory monitors that, you know, the state uh, agency, you know, uh, basically maintains. But the issue is those monitors are sparsely uh, located, right? And it may be located in the area with, oh, go ahead. There are only 25 in the state at last count. Only 25 in the state. And so many cases, I call those regional monitors. That's what's going on in the region, right? But what happens is, hey, I'm getting the permit for my facility. We looked at air quality. We found out that we're in attainment for a particular matter and that the level is five micrograms per meter cube. The monitor is 10 miles away from the neighborhood, right? The monitor may be 20 miles away from the neighborhood. That, so they're saying that 10 micrograms per meter cube is what you've been exposed to at your house. We all know that's not correct. That's what we call exposure misclassification, okay? That's, a, that's, that's bad science. What I can say, like to say is bad data in, bad policy out. So the idea is you have to have a more comprehensive local and hyper-local network to get at what are the levels of pollutants at the actual facility, at the fence line, right? And then that's the data that's more relevant to use for permitting, for enforcement, right, and for regulations, not what's going on 20 miles down the road from my house. And that's why this citizen science, this, I mean, this community science, uh, community-driven, community-based air quality networks are really important. So the, we have this industrial footprint, but our surveillance footprint is not reflective of our industrial footprint, okay? Very important point. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just the monitoring locations. So we monitor, you know, uh, you know, at the church and at some other locations uh, near uh, the concrete uh, facility. And again, these are locations where we have people who are, you know, we have a lot of children who live in this area. 
if you if any of you are familiar with EPA's environmental justice screening tool, we can actually looked at the demographic indicators for uh, this area for Bladensburg. So you have a high percentage of, uh, of people of color, high percentage of people in poverty. When you look at the percentile rankings in the state, it's in the ninth over the ninth percentile in the state. When you look at diesel truck traffic uh, proximity, I'm not diesel truck traffic, uh, 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 diesel uh, proximity and traffic proximity, I think these areas rank above the ninth percentile. So when you think about environmental justice conditions, you already have these conditions of overburden and overexposed to, to certain toxicants uh, that can impact human health, but then you want to expand this facility without taking the proper steps to measure air quality, look at health impacts, and use that information to inform decision-making. Should we expand this facility, right? That's what communities are asking for. Better science, better data, better decision-making. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So I thought it might be a good time before we talk about the emerging, the emerging policies that would come from this better science, if I just asked a few questions to both you and Dory around um, the potential impacts of community-led science programs to improve the overall health of communities in our state. So in all, in all of the spaces where you have highlighted where there are similar projects and different things that are going on, uh, Dory, uh, Dr. Wilson, what are the possible benefits that could be reaped by honing in on this gap between uh, federal level, state level, and agencies who are looking at different impacts to whole communities from, um, it's as if, uh, if we're gonna have an analogy, the idea of looking at a patient's eyes and nose and fingers and toes as if they are separate and disparate from the whole. So what are the potential impacts of us taking on this more integrated approach in the state of Maryland? And I'll, I'll ask Dory to respond first and then yeah. you, Dr. Wilson. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you for that great presentation, uh, Dr. Wilson. Um, I would say that, um, as Dr. Wilson made very clear, the lack of good monitoring data is a really serious issue in Maryland. Um, we have some, we have lots of modeling, but that doesn't substitute for good monitoring. What, what good monitoring in one community can give us, though, is that when you compare that monitoring to what the modeling is telling us, that also not only helps the community in question, but it helps other similar communities because um, the difference between actual monitor pollution and model pollution can be very significant. And in many of these understudies, com understudied communities, that is especially true because it doesn't take into account uh, the unique characteristics of pollution um, including the built environment and airflow, but also many other things. So, um, so, so when we're looking at a specific community like Bladensburg, for instance, um, having those monitors that Dr. Wilson described is in, incredibly important for that community to demonstrate that there are issues there that the state is overlooking, but it's also important for other similar communities with either similar or even not so similar sources, because it can also demonstrate to those communities and to the state that what the state thinks is adequate is, is potentially not so adequate. Um, I'm gonna give it to Dr. Wilson now, but I might have more to say in a little bit. Okay, thank you, Dory. No, definitely what, what Dory is saying, uh, you know, you could have the same sources, so another community with a concrete uh, block plant, a batching plant, Look at the Sheriff Road area, right, in Capitol Heights. You, you have, uh, I think Brandywine has a concrete facility. So, so this type of monitor will be useful there. But we know when you think about the different types of sources, some of the pollutants are the same, right? <laughs> you have particular matter, PM10, PM2.5. You have nitrogen oxides. You, you, you have sulfur dioxide. You have some of the same hazardous air pollutants, right? We, when we combust fossil fuels, we, put, we produce a, a PAHs as well, right? Yeah. Polycyclic aromatic yeah. hydrocarbons. You may have some facilities that produce another set of uh, hazardous air pollutants. So we got to have monitoring networks to allow us to really capture the com more comprehensive exposure profile. And right now, the way we do monitoring, we're not really getting at that comprehensive exposure profile, both for criteria air pollutants mm -hmm. and hazardous air pollutants. And also, I think what's really useful for this kind of um, these lead program, these community led programs, is the fact that you're going to help educate people and raise their awareness, right? There's a lot of tension right now 
a lot of pushback on community science with, well, you know, they're not following the proper QA, QC protocols. Uh, and I think either Dory or uh, Tamara mentioned, well, and you know, Dory mentioned model, a lot of the data from industries, that's model data. Model data has a lot of problems. Even some of the government data, you already heard me mention the fact that you have a sparse network of monitors. So there's some issues with that. So if there's issues with that data, what they do is they have quality assurance, quality control programs. So there could be issues with community collected data. But I think the, the, the sort of uh, factor that comes into play for all three, industry, government, or community data, you got to have a chain of custody. You have to have a, a way you track the, the accuracy in the area issues. You got to have good QA, good quality assurance and quality control. That's very, very important. And if we do that, then this data can say, yes, this data can be used to educate, raise awareness. If it depends upon the type of sensors that we have, oh, now this data could be used for public health studies, right? And then maybe we use a different type of sensor that's more of a, almost a regulatory grade sensor. Now you get the fact that, hey, we can use some of this data for, for zoning. We can use some of this data for enforcement. We can use some of this data for regulations, right? But I think what, what, we, what it drills down the, the bottom line is we have to have good quality assurance, quality control programs with uh, community science, uh, programs and I think people are doing that not just in the partnerships I talked about but in other parts of the country where the data is actually being used uh, for policy and enforcement. And I would actually add one more thing and um, I, I, I guess maybe I'm pointing a term now I, I call it community-based epidemiology because what Sokobi is talking about is the is, is what is in the air, what's in, what's in the air we're breathing, what's in the water we're drinking or fishing in. There's another aspect of that that um, community members are especially close to and can talk to, and that is what, is what health effects are we seeing on the ground. Now, it's hard for someone to say, well, my, you know, my sister-in-law has cancer and my father has cancer and my God, there's a cancer cluster. And that's, that part is not always accurate. Honestly, sometimes it is, but it's not always. But there, but there are things that you can look at that are data driven to see what the health is in your community. There are online resources that talk about asthma frequency and lifespan. You can look at your local elementary school and look at the absentee rates that in an elementary school is very likely caused by, by kids just being sick. And if, those, if that data is way out of whack with what we're seeing elsewhere in the state and elsewhere in the country, there's a problem there. It might not be environmental, but it certainly could be, and it's worth looking into more. And that is a place where community-based people can have a very immediate effect in seeing what's going on. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's definitely opportunity. Oh, sorry. There's definitely opportunities to track data. It's even, there are even uh, studies that have been done now with uh, GPS uh, asthma inhalers with, G with, with GPS uh, capability. So you can know when you have an asthma attack, where, where did it happen? Wow. And so wow. say if we can use that type of technology to, to track asthma. And then in Pittsburgh, there's something called Smell Pittsburgh. There's even apps that have been developed where uh, you can track older issues. They're tracking older issues in Pittsburgh. And what's been shown is the older data tracks well with the particular matter data. And, and so people are collecting older data, right? And, and so it's been tracking well with the PM data. So we can bring that type, those type of apps also to communities too, and communities can, can use that as part of the community science program. Go ahead, Tamara. The about that tomorrow. Maryland, we have worked with uh, the Southwest Pennsylvania um, uh, Health Registry and Frack Tracker, which is based out of DC, but used all along East Coast to do exactly that. A part of where we got to when we'll talk about our uh, proposals and solutions is the idea that we have had communities go out using this SAC software that you can download to your phone to just track when they see incidents of things, which start to form an integrated picture as you both talked about. So uh, from, I'll answer this question first. What are the reactions of communities that we serve to opportunities to participate in community-led science programs? We have had mixed reviews, not because people aren't interested in it, but because they are interested in finding out what will happen to it. And so if we can put our heads together and think about it, there are communities who are seeing a lot of fallout, who are dealing with a lot of harm, and who want to know why, and they're talking to agencies that are that are, that are supposed to have these answers, but don't even understand their underlying conditions. So could uh, Dory and Dr. Wilson, could you talk to us about any reactions you've gotten from communities uh, who've been asked to participate in community-led science programs? Sure. Dory, you wanna go? 
Sure, I'll go. Um, yes, um, and now, now this, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get a little bit into what I'm gonna get into in the next presentation, but I just wanna give you just a flavor. And um, I will be honest with you, it has been a little tough. Um, I think part of what the problem is, is that, um, and, and this is a problem for environmental issues almost across the board, that it, it doesn't have the immediacy as some other issues have. Most environmental issues are chronic. You don't necessarily see the results right away. And many of the communities at greatest risk have more immediate needs. And so this doesn't rise to the top of the agenda, which is unfortunate because environmental issues are insidious and can cause many of the problems that we have in communities. And I'll give you a good example of that. Um, many, much of my work at EPA was, is in lead poisoning prevention. When you track blood lead levels of children, uh, of, of very young children, if you made a graph of that across, across time, and overlay that with a crime graph of, wh of where crime rises and falls, there is almost a perfect correlation between when blood lead levels were highest and 20 years later when crime, cr when crime is highest. And everyone knows that lead causes a number of things, including you know, attention issues and impulse control and ultimately violent, violent crime. Not, not that there is a one-to-one -one correlation, of course not. Um, and not that any child who has elevated blood lead is doomed to a life of crime. Of course not, but there is a correlation yeah. And so when you, so, so, the, so the community might not have seen lead poisoning of a young child as the most important issue. It certainly is an important issue, but maybe not the most important issue. But you know what? If more attention had been paid to that at the time, perhaps we would have seen less violent crime. And we're seeing that, yeah, we, we just saw it really clearly in Baltimore a couple of years ago. Um, so um, I guess this is more a plea. <laughs> to pay attention to this stuff than really a summary of reaction because I don't think that this gets um, the attention that it should get. And for that, I'll, I'll, I can say uh, in the nonprofit uh, en environmental complex, we think a lot about looking at the long-term impacts and what it means to communicate to communities. So as we are hearing that, well, this thing is more important and that thing is more important, it's always easier for us to pull back that layer and say, actually, if you look at this thing, this might be a controversial, nobody can say it is 100% irrefutable, which is, which is often what we're asked to do, but we can tell you that these patterns run together and the likelihood that having deficits in your cognitive thinking and your brain space creates a need for you to self-correct and there are tons of influences that can pretend to fill that gap. Heck yeah, that's something we need to look at. Dr. Wilson, uh, reactions? to communities you've served on participating in community-led science? I mean, you have so many examples, I'm gonna suggest that you might have some positive reactions, but I'd love to hear that from you very briefly. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the, the lead example, we just had a, a lead action day in Baltimore a few weeks ago. So uh, I think that the issue, I think we spoke about earlier, how do you invest in communities? Because if you would invest in the communities, right, to address the issue when it comes to that, then you, you're doing a more holistic approach to community improvement and building uh, resilient communities, right? And so I think that speaks to a, a larger issue about why this kind of work is important. We're trying to build resilient communities, okay? And so a lot of the communities I worked in, like with Omega Wilson, you know, working with them was a very positive, you know, interest. They wanted to do their own science, right? Because they had these issues. They wanted to have science that documented what they already knew anecdotally, right? And so having good science allowed them to look at water quality issues issues, look at hazard disparity issues. Similarly, some of the communities working in Lamsey, I mean, that this research has been really useful for them because they've been able to use this part of revitalization efforts. Uh, they're actually, I just got a phone call last week, we're going to use some of the mapping that we've done previously to help inform their new comprehensive plan in Charleston. Uh -huh. So they're trying to uh -huh. use this information, some of our previous mapping, our data in a comprehensive plan. They've already used it, as you saw from the slide, in shutting down the incinerator. They've also used some of our uh, work to create a, a, a mapping tool called EJ Radar. E EJ Radar has been used to help them with zoning and, with, and green space, getting new green space, so converting the brownfields to new green space. But so there's been some a really positive you know, examples, particularly when it comes to the education empowerment. So the education empowerment is short term. You can kind of see that. And we, when I work in communities, 
even when they may have other issues, I like to talk about it. What are the, what are on one hand, what are the issues that impacts the opportunities, the par, uh, and the partnerships and the benefits, right? So how can we kind of work together on those issues? And the other hand, any issue that we talk about when it comes in the environmental sphere can, can, can be connected to five, one of five things: food, faith, family, health, and jobs. Food, faith family, health, and jobs. So when I engage communities, when they have this, you know, this suite of issues, I bring in food, faith, family, health, and jobs to, to, to kind of bring the, the grounded in what their daily lives are. And then, you know, reposition our research study to inform, what, to be focused on what are their priorities using this food, faith, family, health, and jobs framework, right? Food, faith, health, and job, jobs framework. So I think those are good ways to do it. But on the negative side, and this speaks to the, the negative part of community science, I'm gonna say this quickly. I'm being dumped on. Now I gotta do the science too. <laughs> yes. Right? So the burnout issue. And then one other quick issue is the report back. One huge issue with doing this work is what does this mean? Yes. Okay. I didn't know before. I didn't know before. Now you give me this information. Now what do what do I do about it? You because just, it could it could it could inject hopelessness and powerlessness when you find out I'm exposed to all these things, but now what am I supposed to do about it? So this whole risk communication piece is another challenge when you do this kind of work. And you've and, just touched on what we're gonna focus on in our emerging policy proposals. Um so okay. I'm just gonna presume that just based on this robust conversation that we've had so far, Maryland has a need for community led science. Dory, would you say yes to that? I would say yeah. Dr. Wilson shaking his head. So I, I think along with the Maryland Environmental Health Network and the Environmental Justice Legislative Team, that's a fair few folks who recognize this gap. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, one of the opportunities, Dory, uh, that you have been working on closely with the network and just generally as a person who's passionate about this work in the state of Maryland. So I'll leave, open it up to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Volkswagen Settlement and we are a little, short on time and I wanna make sure there's a lot of room for feedback in the, at the end. So um, I'm gonna run through things a little bit quickly and, but, uh, but I'm happy to stop if people have questions. Um, next slide. Um, I wanna just give the group a little, I, I don't know the background of this group, so I wanna give you a little bit um, of background on why, on why this is important. Um, nitrogen NOx is nitrogen oxides, which is a particular pollutant that causes a number of respiratory diseases, um, particularly asthma. Um, most of the country's air quality is actually decent for NOx. However, the issue is that NOx and volatile organic compounds, otherwise known as VOCs, um, react chemically in the atmosphere with heat and sunlight to for form ground level ozone, which is even a, a, a more severe irritant of lungs. As you can see, it causes a, a number of uh, lung and breathing issues. Um, in, a, and can worsen others, and we're talking very serious um, injuries that, that could possibly lead to um, a, a premature death for, for ozone pollution. Um, ozone, it, the, the country is not in compliance for, with ozone standards at all, and ozone is most likely to reach unhealthy levels on hot summer days in urban environments, and again, that's because both of the pollution there and because of the environmental conditions of heat and sunlight. Um, and just to connect that to Maryland issues, as we are unfortunately contemplating adding more combustion and fossil fuel-based transportation to the state of Maryland, this only raises the likelihood that all of these things will become apex issues. Ab ab absolutely. Um, Knox, I mean, the, a big source is transportation, but, but also um, combustion sources, inclu including all energy generation. Um, so the Volkswagen settlement, um, in those six years, 2009 to 2015, Volkswagen illegally sold vehicles they, in, the, in, their, in, in the mission test, they got around um, EPA and CARB testing requirements by having a defeat device. Um, the specifics are, are not so important for this discussion. However, EPA and CARB jointly sued, found out, sued Volkswagen and settled on a strategy where Volkswagen, as you can see, would need to pay um, $2.7 billion on emission reduction strategies. And that's generally to reduce NOx since the, the pollutant that uh, they were defeating what were, were NOx emissions. Um, the, the, the settlement was spread out around the country. 
Um, California got the lion's share because they brought the case. Um, and, the, and the rest was distributed between states according to how many Volkswagen cars that, that benefited from this illegal test were sold in the state. Uh, Maryland got about $76 million from this settlement. And that needs to be spent over 10 years. Um, more? Next slide. Thanks. Um, and actually, before I, I want to just uh, say one thing to follow up on what uh, Dr. Wilson said earlier, that while NOx is an important uh, component of diesel exhaust, uh, it's not the only component. Uh, particulate matter, including many, many carcinogens, are also in that diesel exhaust. So projects that would reduce NOx would also reduce these other pollutants. Um, so, um, I... Oh, okay. Sorry, my, my fault. Um, the eligible projects, um, there's actually a limited number of eligible projects, and um, they all will reduce NOx pollution, but there are many other sources of NOx pollutions that are not covered by this project. Um, this is diesel emissions from uh, trucks, buses, all, all kinds of buses, um, and, and, and general uh, port equipment, things like that. Um, most uh, the vehicles have to be either replaced or repowered with new diesel, um, clean diesel, alternative fuels like propane or all electric vehicles. And the old vehicles must be scrapped. That's important because there's even an environmental justice or an economic justice issue there in that normally uh, when new trucks get replaced or new buses get replaced, the older vehicles do get sold to smaller companies and which, which, which is good and bad. The smaller companies get a truck that they can afford, but it's also a high polluting truck, which will make them sick. Um, in any case, under that, uh, under this scenario, all of the older vehicles must be scrapped entirely. We want them out of the system. Um, uh, and the deadline to apply for this, and I'll go over this in a second, is has just been postponed. It's now March 2019. Um, it's hugely important because this entire process as you well know, has happened in a really truncated fashion, 30 yes. days to look at um, yes. a report, but um, speculating where all this money was gonna go, put into a lot of buckets that don't really have a lot of definition. And we've been working with the folks at MBE and air quality specifically around being <coughs> clear about what they mean when they say environmental justice uh, with some $12 million dedicated to do it and no internal definition for environmental justice, that could only lead to problems mm -hmm. in spending it in a way that reflects on any of the issues that we touch on today because it's just such a vague lane. So that is very true, and um, and and in some ways it's it, it has improved, and in some ways it's gotten even worse. Uh, but let me get through this first fifteen percent first. Um, the settlement allows up to fifteen percent of the funds to be spent on light duty car electric vehicle infrastructure, and Maryland is planning on using the entire fifteen percent to uh, fund a charging infrastructure throughout the state, and that's generally. A, a good use of, of that money. So we're going to go say, yay, Maryland, and go on from there and talk about the 85, the remaining 85% of the money. Um, next slide. Uh, yes, and in, in the intervening moment, uh, Olivia Thompson oh. wanted to make sure that, uh, that everybody noted that there's no such thing as clean diesel. So we have to be, so we have to be mindful of, of the idea that these buckets where the money will be spent have contain other buckets where if the definitions are not clear, uh, the money can be spent and $75.7 .7 million doesn't sound like a lot of money to some people, but it sounds like a lot of money to us. Okay, and I'll get back to that. <laughs> um, for, um, for, the, for the rest of the money, um, it, it, if some is being specified by the state and some of it, they are open to um, proposals from communities and others, which is one of the reasons I'm talking to this group. Um, for government projects, the settlement will uh, cover up to 100% of replacement or repowering. For non-government projects, there is a required match and it varies from 25% to 75% depending on what vehicle is being replaced and how it is being replaced with a higher, um, uh, I'm sorry, a lower match required for diesel, for, for electrifying vehicles, um, which are also more expensive. Um, now, the next part gets into exactly what Tamara was talking about. The old breakout um, had a big chunk going to private and federal uses, a 16% going to local community and environmental justice uh, areas, 
as Tamara said, that was not very well defined at all, and 30% going to the state. Um, they got, Tamara and I both commented on that in the draft plan, and apparently they got other comments as well. Um, they changed the, the, the breakout now. This is still in development, and the re only reason I know this is because we were at a meeting with the state, which was the first time that they unveiled this, but so far as I can tell, it is not formal. And I would imagine that all of this is still under discussion and, and may be changed. But as of today, or at least of that, as of this week, 28% um, of the money, or, at least, or about one third after you take away the 15% for infrastructure, goes to state vehicles. And one criteria that they are using is that they, they, they say they would like to benefit underserved communities. And how they're interpret, interpreting this for this part is that they're giving a very heavy emphasis on the Port of Baltimore um, and looking toward, we, we thought they were going to electrify the port. That was how we were talking about it. Um, the most recent we've heard is that they are not, not talking about electrification so much and more on cleaner diesel and, and propane and also transit buses. And they are looking at for input on transit bus routes that are of highest concern. Um, the remaining two thirds are for partnerships. Again, very loosely defined from what we can tell, but that includes a uh, public private partnership, county governments, municipal municipalities, and um, communities. Um, as as uh, I, 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 the more we talk about this though, the more it becomes clear that this is not the typical community-based project in that um, generally communities don't own, you know, like in like a neighborhood wouldn't own a diesel vehicle, but uh, but but uh, but an industrial source in a neighborhood might own a, a diesel vehicle. For example, the Bladensburg plant that Dr. Wilson was talking about earlier, um, they do own diesel vehicles, and they may and this money would be available to them to clean up their old diesel vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, however, unless the community empowers themselves to insist on it. There is nothing to force that source owner to, to, to take part in this at all. Um, and or for them to even magically be capable of identifying exactly a, a neighbor who hasn't been very friendly by all right. accounts relative to pollution. Exactly. Right. So they right. magically be empowered to say, hello, you've destroyed my life, my future, and, um, and at the epigenetic level, my, the chances for my children. Could we have a conversation about replacing vehicles because the government wants exactly. to talk to you about money? Exactly. And by the way, you still have to pay a match to replace your vehicle. So, so th there's not really a good leverage point here, but, but, we'll, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the evaluation criteria as proposed, and again, this was proposed in the, in the first go round. It very well may have changed by now, but we don't, if, if it has changed, we don't know that. But regardless, we are certain that the biggest criteria will be estimated NOx reductions. That is the point of the settlement. Um, it's, it's appropriate um, given, given the history of this project and, and you know, it makes sense that that's the, the evaluation criteria. The other ones are um, reduction in other pollutants, as we've talked about, there are many other pollutants that come from diesel exhaust. Project sustainability, which basically means that the money will dry up eventually and can this project, if, 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 if we give seed money to turn over a fleet, is there some likelihood that the rest of the fleet can also turn over afterwards? Uh, benefits to underserved communities. I'm hopeful that that little bit of evaluation criteria will, will rise, but I have no <laughs> assurance that that will happen. Um, uh, a cost share, the ability to make the cost share and advanced technologies really meaning can it move the, 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 you know, the country forward in terms of cleaning up transportation sources. Okay, that is a very quick rundown of what this project is. And now we're going to talk about the opportunities it presents. So um, the next slide is the last slide. Um, so the, the first of these opportunities is the opportunity that the state has been talking about for quite a while, where, at, where the, either the community or a local source or a local school system, or for that matter, you know, a, a, a private company or something like that, or, or church could propose a project to replace or repower 
buses or trucks or, or things like that. And in fact, uh, there, there is one example of that happening in a community in Baltimore. Um, there is a locally owned uh, trash company that uh, is both located in the community and picks up trash from the community. And they are going to apply to um, either replace or repower their trash trucks, uh, which is great because trash trucks operate in communities. Um, they go very slowly. I mean, you know, I don't have to tell you how trash trucks operate, but they go very slowly through community streets. And then they end up at the incinerator where they just kind of hang out and wait for the line of trucks to go to, to go down. So that's so that's a great example of how, how something can come together and, and work through this project. The problem is, is that that, that, that kismet of those things happening at once is, doesn't happen very often. It's, it's unusual that there's a trash company that operates in a community of concern that, and is owned in a community of concern, and that community is already keyed into state government. That, that, that is very unusual. Yeah. But, um, but there m may be other things, I mean, with, with the folks on this call, there might be kind of a wide knowledge base of where this might ha happen. Um, in addition, there are things like, um, I'll just give you a couple of examples, um, things like a church in a community that might have an older bus that they just use for maybe a church school or to pick up people to go to church services or, or things like that. Um, this, this would, uh, uh, in a community of concern, this, this money would be available to them as well. And, um, and the other thing that I would mention is that communities might not always know what buses, what, what vehicles operate there, although they might, but they would certainly know if there's a depot of any sort in that community, a depot or a loading or a drop-off location. And that would be a good focus for this kind of spending. And as a matter of fact, the Bladensburg community that Dr. Wilson had talked about also does have a bus depot in their neighborhood. So, yep. so, this, so this might be a good use of money um, there. But as someone said in the recent meeting with the state, it, it is hard for, for a community member to, to start to guess about what businesses in their community also operate in their community, or if they see a truck going down a neighborhood street, where the headquarters of that truck is, and is it an older truck, and would they be available to re replace it? It's, it's a very hard, that's a steep ask for a community member to do. I think that However, was Greg, Greg Sawtell of United Workers. In the yes, Baltimore. yes. However, um, the state has that information, and we could be asking for them to crunch data much better for us, not to do all the work for us, but at least to point in the, in the directions that we need to look at. And what that means is that um, we, we, we do have some knowledge about what communities are of highest concern. Um, I've listed the counties that are in um, ozone non-attainment on the screen. They're basically the counties right in the middle of Baltimore, everything uh, of Maryland, everything except Western Maryland and, um, and the Eastern Shore although there actually are even some problems in the Eastern Shore. Um, but, but still, everything in that area is not equally non-attaining. <laughs> certainly you can assume that you know, Baltimore, has, Baltimore City and Baltimore County has special problems that are, are, that are worse than other parts of the area. Um, but in addition to that, Maryland ha is, has a big state government. They, ha they, they have MTE, but also transportation, who can help us to identify what vehicles are older and would therefore be most highly polluting, and to do a crosswalk between where, where, what, where those areas are at least registered and where, and where those communities are in, uh, in, in, in relative to ozone non-attainment. Um, it wouldn't be the end of the discussion. There would still be a huge need for community input in terms of what makes sense and um, our vehicle, you know, how, how frequently the vehicles operate and so on and so forth. But it would still be, it would, it would take us from looking at virtually all of the diesel vehicles in all of the state <laughs> to, 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 a, to, a ver, to a reasonably smaller subset of things that we could get our hands around and then talk about what does make sense for our communities. Um, another idea, um, just came up for, uh, in a recent discussion of, um, of a group talking about um, transportation, you know, progression in general. And that would be just to have um, somehow 
undefined as of today, um, an environmental justice trans transportation zone or zones for priority attention to replace dirty vehicles, period. And that would allow um, potentially focused, heightened attention to be paid towards that community to make real differences in that community. And, um, and then research can be done to figure out, well, what, 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 it, what is causing the NOx and ozone pollution in that neighborhood? And, and, and it, it would at least provide some focus. I think the, the, the idea now is that um, in item number one, proposing projects of special concern, we can absolutely get some really good projects out of that, but it's sort of hit or miss. And there's not a, there, it's, 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 you know, who's, who's connected, who, who, who can get to this, um, rather than a really considered approach to talk about the, the worst problems first and to empower communities that might not already be empowered to propose projects. And with that, that is the end of my presentation, but I would very much like to hear from folks on ideas, questions, whatever you have. And I see there's a bunch in the chat. Yes, um, Dr. Wilson, do you wanna weigh in a bit on what, Dory, um, what Dory's mentioned while we ask uh, folks, as you'll see, you'll find that you're, you're on mute. Yeah. So you will be able to weigh in with your own questions. And if you're feeling shy, send it to us in the chat box and I'll read it to our presenters. Dr. Wilson? Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think this is a really good opportunity to, to, to say that we have the Maryland Environmental Justice Screening Tool that's been in development. And so that screening tool will allow us to screen for communities based on a score that like these are the communities that we should focus on. So we should look yeah. at doing to dig deeper into the sources of diesel emissions. And, and, and so I think we have that tool. I would like to see the state government and county governments, governments step up and say we want to use this tool for these type of policies these type of initiatives. And it, when that means step up, they need to invest in the tool. The state of Maryland no longer has an excuse for not knowing where to go. The tool has been in development for over a year. Where we are right now, we need a few more resources to expand the tool. But what, what I'm saying today is the state of Maryland no longer has an excuse to say, we do not have a way to screen for communities. This tool is based off the Cal Enviro screen model with some uh, pulling from the national EPA's EJ screening tool. So you have that. And then also, I like the idea of the EJ transportation zones. There's another, there's a similar construct called eco districts or environmental benefits districts that could be also applied to say, hey, we have this screening tool, we know where to go. Let's apply an eco district in that community where it has a high score. And part of that application, we're going to, we're going to invest in looking at diesel emissions and doing some things as it relates to a conversion of vehicles and, and addressing diesel emissions. So I think the two together, screening tool, and as a solution, applying this eco district or environmental benefits district construct is the way to take care of two things at one time. Thank you. And I, yep. um, while we wait to get some more questions from the folks who are uh, lingering in the in the in the internet, there, I'll talk a little about an additional um, potential proposal. So what Dory just covered is the scope of what's happening in the regulatory space. Those dollars would be in addition to other funds that have already been available for some of these purposes. And with the idea that we can make a real dent if we are to go to where the sources of these issues are. How do we determine where those, where those sources are? We have some national tools. Uh, we have heard very little about what what some of the other agencies who are responsible for. So it sounds a lot like Maryland Department of Environment is in the driver's seat here, but they're not the only one on the hook. So uh, here at the network, as a part of the environmental justice legislative team and some other efforts, we are exploring the concept with our partners in the network for a community science data bill in the next legislative session. What that would do is direct the Maryland Department of Environment, the Department of Natural Resources, and the Department of Health to develop regulations to collect track and respond to community derived data collect and what it would do is trigger timely review by an agency of what a community has come up with it would could trigger agency led studies of of what has been found to confirm or otherwise respond to it it could create um, some space for what dr wilson mentioned which is networking of integrated data that includes community and agency data that really brings together the best layers of tools and create a factual obligation that matches our, I'll say it, moral relationship. We are, we are fiduciaries in, in social contract with one another. And what happens to a community 
when they've done everything they could possibly do to prove to their local health officer or the Department of Natural Resources in the community science space, water, water, water uh, adjacent communities have done so much work here, just trying to prove that there are harms coming through the waterways in the Chesapeake in the community space. Lead has been a huge barrier to entry for growth and development of communities. And in national and local instances, the community science data, the proof of just gathering your own information and taking it to somebody whose job and mission is already deeply aligned there has been a thing that has helped to move the policy. But in, a, in our state, we have nothing that commands that it happens. The network has worked, like I said, with Frack Tracker and the Southwest Environmental Health Program to look at just these kinds of things in the context of natural gas infrastructure. That's well pads, that's uh, pipelines, and all the stuff that comes with it, methane regulations, and all these other things. But if we do all this good work and there is nothing that compels these agencies to take it on, we will exhaust communities that are already exhausted and provide them no space. So a C, it, I can tell from the looks of our panelists that they already think that this is a good idea because there is a real gap, a deep vacuum. Um, to follow that up, there are some upcoming legislative proposals that we've talked about across the course of these conversations uh, as the fall briefing series started in September. And the things that, that community science will provide uh, support for is an expanded community health Healthy Air Act, which we heard from the sponsor, will likely come back in 2020. Uh, Connor Wingo legislation around uh, what's happening at the dam and what the backups mean for a statewide water. Judicial review and public participation law will be improved if there was some trigger that meant that communities were able to weigh in, not just in the conversation, but in the collection of data that underlines what they're saying is happening. And phone ban legislation, all that, all that data collected by Mr. Trashwheel, Professor Trashwheel, could go a lot further if it wasn't just demonstrative. Lead in schools testing, the toxics rule update, and the idea that we are gonna be pushing for a Maryland Green Amendment in the state of Maryland to get climate into the Constitution and push for reduction of generational harm to the environment as the federal government fails to stand up for us. So what about that would not be improved by a robust and explicit review of community science and a moral obligation for these agencies to take it up? Um, any thoughts, uh, Dory and Dr. Wilson, on this, these two proposals working together or any individual one that you wanna comment on? Because this, this is a lot for, our, um, pan for the folks who are listening, so I know we should uh, open up some space by just thinking about what we've been talking about today. Yeah, go ahead, Dory. I was just gonna say, I think I need space. <laughs> <laughs> it, and the, the good thing is in a community science, uh, <laughs> work, we need everybody to get it done. So it is a lot to think about. <laughs> if we have, you and I have been in several rooms together where in the, in the looming mm -hmm. conversation around $75.7 .7 million, I have argued that this is moonshot money and we should not be spending the money on a flu shot. Which is, which is what, so I, we have our own, you know, views on whether or not we're going to spend these dollars, but what could this kind of money do to help evaluate whether these things are happening? What happens after the money is gone if we don't have any built-in responsibility to evaluate whether it's been successful and who's in a better place to do that than a community person at the, at the level where it is not, where they are currently not being served? Right. One, one thing I would say is that um, for the, 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 the seventy six million dollars really provides two opportunities. It's it's the it's the result the opportunity to get to a result of cleaning up vehicles, but it's also an opportunity to pilot a process, and that would be um, how how does the community get involved? The the community involvement framework that the state has proposed doesn't really work. It 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 is it is too hard. It's hit or miss. It only really empowers communities who are already who already have some sense of power. It doesn't affect, and it, and it doesn't get at the worst problems. But by by definition, it, there's no way to you know figure out what where the worst worst problems are. I think if we do something along the lines that um, I said, and then I I love what you said, Dr. Wilson, about putting all that together. Um, that that can change both the result, but also the process. And the process might even have longer term implications than the specific result. And just to be, and just quickly to so open up to other questions, I would say that and I think I said this to, to both of you before, and I know I talked to Dory about this. This money should be used to to build out surveillance networks. 
-hmm. in areas that have a lot of traffic. I mean, to me, <laughs> to be this like, duh, you got a lot of traffic. You got these, these sources. Should, it, this shouldn't be on the community, right? This part of it shouldn't be on community. This is an ample opportunity to invest in hyper-local surveillance networks of these contaminants of concern and get near real-time data that can be guided to the community so it can educate race awareness, it can modify their risk of virtual behaviors, they know where not to go, and it can be used for mitigation. That to me is where, where is that at in this proposal? That's where the money, that's where a good chunk of money should be going around these, not just urban areas, but also in rural areas that also like Brandywine has 3,500 diesel truck trips per day, mm -hmm. right? That's a lot of diesel truck trips with those power plants. That to yeah. me is a no brainer. I, I, I don't disagree with anything you just said as far as what should be done, but we still have to work within the constraints of the settlement agreement for better or worse, which really does, it's, it, it, it is very specific and, and does explicitly say that the money can only be used for vehicle replacement or repowering, and in some cases, additional technologies like idle reduction, things like that. Unfortunately, I do not disagree with you at all that, that we need that monitoring network, and that would go so far in telling us yeah how to better spend this money. And perhaps that is something that we should be pushing for separately because we really, it is hard to make decisions about how to spend this money without exactly. that data, as you, as you say. So you don't have the front end, you have, you don't have the front end data. How are you going to do the solution and the decision making about how to use it? We don't have the front end information. To me, it's like, I'm just, I'm just going to throw something at the dartboard and let's see what happens. Exactly. That's what this is. That, that, I agree. That is where we're, where we're at right now. Um, so, but maybe I mean, but I'm all, my only point is that we can't use this money for that. There's a lot of other state money and, and maybe yes. with, with a relatively small investment of state money, we could use this money so much better because we would be able to have yeah. more confidence that we were hitting the worst of the worst. And you heard okay. it, here. you heard it here, folks. It sounds like uh, our next piece of strategy with the folks we've been working on in the network, which includes everyone on this call is that we really do need to think about what's the most synergistic and dynamic use of this money. If it's slotted in the buckets by lawyers who have worked really hard to define every single term, what are the other buckets of money that could make this more effective? Evaluation dollars, monitoring, those are things that would improve this investment. And, if it, and it sounds like an op-ed to me, so uh, stay tuned if, you, if, you, if, you do, if, we, if we don't get anywhere with the internal conversation for a public dialogue about that very very thing. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm going to take this moment to just thank you both for providing a wealth of experience and understanding and analysis. Um, Jory and I are going to talk about it, but I think we're going to do a webinar just on the VW settlement writ large because there are so many different folks, if not an in-person discussion around uh, what that's going to mean for communities in Maryland because they are, are being asked to do this work and asked to do another thing. And if we don't frame it right as uh, environmental advocates, health advocates, folks concerned with justice and practitioners, we are failing our communities who could very well have their health outcomes improved by this kind of action. Uh, let me see if it looks like we have, uh, let me just check. Uh, we got a comment from Olivia, Elvia. She completely agrees that a lot of the settlement money should be spent in communities that are being polluted daily with diesel truck traffic, but doesn't want to lose view of getting more private electric cars on the road and for more infrastructure so that owning an EV isn't a special burden. Uh, electric cars are getting affordable and there are federal and state rebates that are still in place, but we have to keep in mind that most daily trips are short with, ease, with EV range. That's actually quite practical. Uh, any thoughts on that comment? Um, I completely agree with it. Um, as I, I, I sort of gave a little, maybe short shrift to that um, initial uh, description I made of the 15% of the money taking, being taken off the top for electric infrastructure, but that is specifically to support electric cars and other light, light duty vehicles. And I believe there are usually a number of bills in the legislature, and I, I assume there will be similar bills this year too, to, um, to, to, to make that money go even further, to talk about charging stations in apartment buildings and things, and, and at gas stations, and along highways. So th this money will be spent for that, and it'll go pretty far, actually. Um, and, and, there, and there's actually another pot of money that I didn't talk about, because it's not 
the community isn't being asked how to spend it. But but there's a lot of attention being paid to the issue that you bring up. I absolutely agree that that's very important. Uh, there are a lot of cars out there. So so yes. And but but there's more to say about this as well because there will be things to support during the legislative session and otherwise. Yes, if Thank we, you. we get our coalition going, the citizen science data bill will be one of them mm -hmm. and it'll likely come with a briefing that's in person during the legislative session and it'll be a great place to flesh out all the other areas where this kind of effort could be supportive of the work. Mm -hmm. Um, what you're seeing on your screen are some basic backgrounders on community science uh, in the context of Maryland, generally uh, where people are doing it in Maryland and where we have failed to produce good policy as a result of not having this kind of capacity. Uh, if you want to follow us uh, in the future, uh, this briefing um, is a part of an entire series that started in September and ends at the end of December. Uh, it is located um, on our Environmental Justice Legislative Team webpage, but it also can be found, the recording will be on our YouTube page, and you wouldn't believe the number of people that spend a lot of time pouring through this dense information very slowly uh, through the YouTube function and being able to think about it. So we will keep this space open through the Environmental Justice Legislative Team, which meets on Mondays during the legislative session, and through that website, uh, the Maryland Environmental Health Network website, you should be able to contact us because we're going to have conversations about each of these things that are uh, in depth. Um, you can see the previous briefings on the um, document on that was on the last slide and the very next briefing will be in December on uh, December 3rd at noon and it'll be on air quality and community health. I would be very surprised if the several of the themes that were raised here today do not show up in that space uh, as we orient the framework as we get closer to the legislative session. I will take this opportunity to thank our guests Dory Cantor Pastor and Dr. Sokobi Wilson for sharing their time and their capacity and their lived experience um, and just so you know, folks are just for you to know that they, they also appreciate you. They want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And have a great day, everybody. Bye -bye. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Oh, Happy yes. Thanksgiving. Happy Turkey Day. Happy Turkey Day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>